go ahead and get started. It's about seven now. So I welcome, if this is your first time, Brooklyn Public Philosophers. It's like a monthly public philosophy speaker series and discussion series, uh, bringing in philosophers from, from the greater Brooklyn area to talk about their work. So I'm really thrilled that Serene can join us. She's a professor of philosophy at Brooklyn College and author of Adaptive Preferences and Women's Empowerment. So I'm if you could join us in welcoming, welcoming our speaker. Thank you. So I'm going to start out by thanking Ian for that introduction and for organizing this talk. I am really appreciative of Brooklyn Public Philosophers as a space, and people are always talking about how academics need to talk to people outside of academia all the time, but nobody actually does the labor to make that happen. So I'm especially grateful to Ian for recognizing this venue, or for creating this venue. Um, also, I just want to thank everyone who's here. Before I go ahead and get started, um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more philosophers in the room than I expected to see. So I just want you to know that I went out of my way to sort of frame this talk in a non-technical way because I wanted it to be for a wider audience. Um, I want to let philosophers in the room know that if you want to push me on the technical stuff in the Q&A, you should feel really free to do so. Um, so as um, Ian mentioned, I'm here to talk with you a little bit about um, Adaptive Preferences and Women's Empowerment, which is a book that I wrote in 2011. Um, I think whenever I hear a talk, I want people to tell me what they're going to say before they go on and say it. So I'm going to start out actually by just telling you what I am um, sort of setting out to prove um, and giving you a roadmap of what I'm going to say in the rest of the talk. So basically, what I want to show in the talk today is this. I'm trying to, I'm going to explain what adaptive preferences are in a minute, but for now, I want you guys to know that what I'm trying to demonstrate is that understanding adaptive preferences as autonomy deficits both fails to capture sort of what's wrong with many adaptive preferences um, and justifies disrespect toward people who are oppressed and deprived. So what I'm trying to do is reject the view that adaptive preferences are primarily defined as autonomy deficits. Um, and then at the very end, I'm going to suggest that a better alternative is to think of adaptive preferences as deficits in the ability to lead a flourishing life. Um, I also just kind of want to give you a map of where I am headed in the rest of the talk. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do um, on my way to demonstrating why I think adaptive preferences shouldn't be thought of as, a, as autonomy deficits is um, I'm going to start out with two stories that are taken from sort of ethnographic research about women in the global south to give you a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about adaptive preferences. Um, then in the, um, the second thing I'm going to do is to sort of define autonomy and say why the people I am rejecting want to define adaptive preferences as autonomy deficits. Um, and finally, I'm going to go through three autonomy-based definitions of adaptive preferences and say why they fail. So the first one I'm going to consider is the idea that adaptive preferences are deficits in reflectiveness or rationality. Um, the second one I'm going to consider is the idea that adaptive preferences are deficits in the ability to resist socialization. Um, and third, um, I'm going to consider the view that adaptive preferences are deficits in a person's self-esteem. So those are the three views of what adaptive preferences are that I'm going to reject. Um, as um, Before I actually get into the meat of the talk, I just want to say a couple of things about my methodology, especially for, um, for people who aren't philosophers in the room. So the first thing is I want to, I've been using this word adaptive preferences, you saw that it was in the title of the talk, what does it mean? Well, part of what's at stake in my talk is how to define it. But to give you a sense of what we loosely mean when we talk about adaptive preferences, we are usually talking about uh, preferences in wherein oppressed or deprived people perpetuate their oppression or deprivation. So um, when I use the word adaptive preferences, I have in mind something like that, and this will become clearer when we move to the two examples we're going to move to in a minute. Um, I also just want to say for folks who aren't um, necessarily so familiar with academic philosophy in the room, um, the question I'm trying to answer is like a normative question. So 
Um, that means it's a question about what right and wrong are, um, and a question about morality. And so part of what I'm trying to answer in this talk is what is particularly morally problematic about adaptive preferences, or why do people think that adaptive preferences require some kind of political action? So the question I'm trying to answer is sort of why do people intuitively morally feel like adaptive preferences deserve some kind of moral or political attention that other kinds of preferences don't deserve? Um, finally, I just want to make one point about my method. Um, I find that whenever I am talking, when I'm talking with friends about who are philosophers about articles that we write or what I'm teaching, people get hung up on the fact that we spend so much time talking about the views that we're trying to reject. Um, so I just want to be really clear that even though I'm going to spend a ton of time talking about autonomy in this talk, my ultimate aim is to show that autonomy-based definitions of adaptive preferences are not the ones that we should adopt. So. Now that I've laid that all out, let's actually get into the meat of the talk. Um, and as I said, to kind of give you a sense of what adaptive preferences are, um, I want to start with two stories that come from anthropology and sociology of people who did ethnographic research, meaning um, participant observation with people and countries in the global south. I want to be clear before I get into these stories that I don't think adaptive preferences are exclusively held by women in the global south. And um, if you're a philosopher who, um, or a kind of a women's studies person who's inside of this debate, one of the things that people criticize is that adaptive preferences are only talked about in reference to women in the global south. That's a view that I have explicitly opposed in a lot of my writing, but if people want to ask me about that view, Later, you should feel free to ask me about it. The examples I'm going to focus on are from the Global South, but I want to be super clear that I think um, women everywhere engage in behaviors that perpetuate their oppression and sometimes um, internalize their oppression. So, two stories. The first one is this. Um, this comes from the work of Hilda Jacobson, who's a Norwegian anthropologist who works in Tanzania. Part of why I chose this example and why I've used her work a lot is that um, I used to live in Tanzania, so I have a, a bit more familiarity with the context she's describing than I might have about other people's work. Um, this is from a focus group in which Hilda got together um, a group of women of various ages um, in the same village and asked them to talk about this idea that um, she found to be prevalent in the, in the village, which was this idea that there's such a thing as a good beating, um, meaning a right way for a husband to beat his wife. Um, this is an interaction between two women in the community. So the first woman says, let's say you come home, and he asks where you've been. You start answering badly, like a crazy person, saying, we, the women of Africa, have been created with a certain right of control, too. Who are you to say that men should have more power than women? He just asks you and you answer carelessly, rudely like that. Of course he must be you. Uh, then another woman says back, well, he can choose. He doesn't have to. And then Maria repeats, of course, but I mean, you, you must expect it. You can't shout like you're innocent or surprised. Um, the second story, um, and I've chosen both of these stories because I have personal connections to them. So before I talk about the particular story about Java, um, I want you guys to know that in a lot of my work, I choose examples about um, unjust intra-household food distributions, which is um, a fancy way of saying um, when food is allocated unevenly in a household, um, on the, often on the basis of gender. So, um, a lot of societies have um, norms that say that men deserve more and superior food. Um, and there's lots of evidence that this contributes to women's mal malnutrition sort of all over the world, especially in Asia. Part of why I'm personally connected to it is that um, my family, my extended family practices this. So the women in my family wait until after the men have finished eating to eat. So. As sort of an anecdotal little story about me, part of why I became obsessed with writing about adaptive preferences is trying to kind of understand, well, why do the women in my family do this? This example is from Java and not India, though. Um, but it's also an example that has to do with food inequality. And it comes from Hannah Papanek's work. Um, and she recounts an elderly Javanese woman recalled from her own childhood that girls were taught to restrain themselves 
not only with respect to food, but also with respect to other pleasures in life. Her mother told her that girls need to restrain themselves not only with food, uh, I'm sorry, I, that's a repeated, so I have a quote, I'm sorry. Um, her mother told her that girls needed to develop more inhibition, in, inhibitions, also in self-expression, because women set the norms for civilization and men cannot control themselves. Um, so, as I told you, um, I was laying out these stories to give you sort of an idea of what kinds of things people might consider adaptive preferences to be. Um, but now I just want to stop to ask the audience a question. So I want to know sort of what you think development practitioners should do when they encounter people who express preferences like these. And you don't have to express your own view if you don't feel ready to express that, but what kinds of things can you imagine people saying development practitioners should do when they encounter people who are saying things like, there's such a thing as a good beating, you shouldn't stand up for yourself, or women should eat less than men because um, women are morally superior to men in their ability to control their, their desires. Yeah, can you tell me your name, actually? My name is Erin. Yeah. Why can't one preference it and say, okay, um, maybe in your culture, but in my culture, we do this. To yeah. Do um, to prepare. Okay, so um, you certainly could do that. Um, and one of the things that I say sort of in the longer work is that um, one of the things you want to find out is sort of what resources there are in every culture for combating injustice. But do you want to go to the your my cult culture, my culture thing enough that you want to say that these preferences should kind of be left intact? My personal yeah, yeah. Is, is that there is some kind of equality if I wait to that and I, it's important to me, I would, I would nudge okay. and open the door, as I say, to, well, there's an option. Yeah, okay, so that's... If, you're, if there is an option where you can't go and call 911 sure. and um, say no. Yeah, so what you're saying is actually um, somewhat similar to the view that I end up adopting about what we should do. So I'm happy to talk about that more in the question and answer, and answer session. But I want to pull out what you said that you, you still kind of want to nudge and see, like, does this person really want to have this preference? Why does the person have this preference? Um, can I just ask kind of for a poll how many people sort of have that feeling that like, we need to find out why this person has this preference, like maybe something is wrong with the preference. Who has that intuition? Okay. So, um, I also have that intuition, right? So part of what I'm trying to do in this paper is say how to explain that intuition without focusing um, on autonomy. But I want you guys to see, I brought up um, this question to kind of get you guys to see um, what I'm trying to explain. People have this gut feeling that something is especially like wrong with these kinds of preferences, that people aren't really attached to them, that they have acquired them in some kind of way that's different from other pre how preferences are acquired. Um, if I stood up here with an example that says, I asked Charlie what kind of food she liked, and she said I like chocolate ice cream, and I said I like vanilla ice cream. Most of you guys probably would not have the same intuitive reaction to the difference in our preferences. So something seems especially problematic about these kinds of preferences. Um, what I'm gonna do now is go into discussing one explanation people offer of why those preferences are problematic. Um, and as I've said, I'm gonna reject it. So first, um, the view that I'm trying to reject is the view that why these preferences are morally problematic is that they constitute deficits in autonomy. So important to kind of moving to the next step, I just want to say sort of what I think, what autonomy is, and sort of why people like autonomy-based um, explanations of what adaptive preferences are. So, um, oops, sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> um, when I use the word autonomy, I'm referring to something that philosophers would call personal autonomy, and what personal autonomy is, um, 
is kind of loosely the capacity to be your own person, um, the capacity to live according to motives and values that are genuinely your own. So if I think adaptive preferences are autonomy deficits, I think that the reason that these preferences are morally problematic is that they don't really reflect the person's values or the person never had the ability to form values that were genuinely their own. Um, just to give folks who are um, not philosophers a sense of sort of where you might find value for autonomy in your own um, sort of self-understanding. Um, Usually, when, uh, in everyday life, we talk about how you should sometimes respect the de decisions of other people even when you don't agree with them. The most common justification for that, if you probe people, is that other people have values of their own, are their own people, and have come up with their own decisions by reasoning to them. So, um, value for autonomy is something that I think a lot of us intuitively connect to if I ask you sort of why should you respect other people's decisions or preferences. Um, now that I've said a little about what autonomy is, um, I'm going to turn to talking a little bit about why people want to say that adaptive preferences are autonomy deficits. Um, and I think the reason is this. Um, People like the idea that adaptive preferences are autonomy deficits because that lets feminists say that um, women who perpetuate their oppression because they've never had a chance to form their own values. And so feminism doesn't involve imposing values ex that are external to women on them. Feminism involves giving women the ability to, um, to form their own values for the first time. So one place you might see this is um, who's read like a popular media report about like microcredit or about half the sky or something like that? Okay. So one of the most common things that you'll see in the narratives of women that get cherry picked to go into these stories um, is that they say something like, I didn't think about who I was before. Now as a result of this development and intervention, I have a sense of self and I think critically in a way that I did not before. So I want to suggest that one of the reasons that people like that narrative is that it lets it seem like what's going on when you try to change a person's adaptive preferences is just that you're giving them the ability to critically think something that they didn't have before. Um, it's also, I think, um, for folks who work in kind of any social science fields related to this, I think this is also why um, people like to use the word empowerment a lot, is that they want to suggest that the initial state that the person is in um, is a state not just where they lack power, but where they lack sort of reflectiveness or a sense of what they care about. And part of what empowerment does is introduce to them um, reflectiveness or a sense of what they care about. Um, okay. So, as I said, um, now that I've told you why people like that view, I'm going to spend kind of the bulk of the talk talking about what I think is wrong with that view. Um, I don't want to be a pain, but is there a way I could get like water? Actually, I think there might be enough to bring to uh, I should have thought of it. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> just feel myself getting um, a little bit hoarse. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, I'm gonna go through three um, autonomy-based definitions of what adaptive preferences are and say what I think is wrong with those definitions. Um, so, um, the first one, um, it defines, the first kind of definition of autonomy that you can use to define adaptive preferences is you might say, well, autonomy is the ability to reflect or to act rationally. So you might say on this definition, well, adaptive preferences are um, formed because people have not adequately reflected um, or they are not acting in a way where they sort of think about the various options available to them. So on this first definition, um, Thank you so very much. I'm very sorry for sending you out. <laughs> um, I should have thought of this. Um, so you might say adaptive preferences are morally problematic because 
and we don't respect them the way we respect other preferences because those preferences um, were formed in a way that was less reflective or less rational than other preferences. Um, I think that there um, are a couple of different problems with that view. So the view, again, is that adaptive preferences are deficits in rationality. Um, and I think um, the first one is that I actually believe that many adaptive preferences are more reflective than their non-adaptive counterparts. And I actually think that the example of the Javanese woman shows that really well. So um, that woman has to have an uber-reflective attitude about her food cons consumption. An attitude that we would, where we would potentially say that the healthier attitude is a less reflective one. And not only does she have to have a very reflective attitude toward her food consumption, she has to have a very sort of robustly reasoned explanation of why she needs to eat less than men. So there's this whole story about men are weak, women are better at controlling their appetites. Um, and I don't think this is just particular to that example. Um, one of the kind of bigger points that I make in my work is that I think people um, kind of naturally seek their basic welfare. So one of the things that's going to happen if society is going to convince you to not pursue your basic welfare is that society may have to tell you a very complicated story about why it's not that important for you to eat. So um, one problem with the view that a defining um, characteristic of adaptive preferences is that they are rationality deficits, is that I think that actually many um, adaptive preferences are more reflective um, and involve a lot more sort of reasoning than their um, less adaptive counterparts. And I think that um, theories of ideology do a really good job showing us that, that part of what you sometimes need to convince people to perpetuate their oppression is a really sort of robust set of reasons that they ought to comply with the, um, with the dominant order. Um, the second problem I have um, with the view that adaptive preferences um, are deficits in rationality is that, um, so first of all, I don't, I mean, so you guys kind of see that I don't buy that people who have adaptive preferences are less sort of reflective or rational than other people. A consequence that I really want to avoid that I think comes up really easy, easily when you say that adaptive preferences are deficits in rationality is the consequence that says, well, so then why consult these people about what they want at all, right? If they are, or why, you know, why ask them questions about why they do what they do? You were saying kind of like why ask them about what they value in their culture? Why ask them at all? if we have reason to suspect that they are worse at reasoning than the people who are intervening. So to me, um, one of the sort of biggest problems I have with the view that adaptive preferences are deficits in rationality is that it sort of kicks out the justification for consulting um, oppressed or deprived people about their oppression or deprivation. Um, so that definition of adaptive preferences as an autonomy deficit focused on the idea that autonomy was rationality. Now I'm going to switch to a different understanding of autonomy. Um, and that's an understanding of autonomy as the ability to resist socialization. So you might say a person is not their true self or something if they are unable to reject or scrutinize social norms. Um, and so you might say one of the reasons that the Javanese woman or the Tanzanian woman that we talked about in the examples um, perpetuate their oppression is that they have, they have failed to question gender roles that they have been socialized into. Um, so to talk about um, a couple of um, problems with that. Actually, before I go there, I want to say something about my background view about this view of autonomy that might help you understand my criticisms, which is that often I kind of joke that this is like the view of autonomy that teenagers have. Um, so I think a lot of teenagers have this, like you, I definitely went through this. I went through this phase where I realized like, oh, society told me to do all these things. I'm not a real person because I'm doing what society told me to do. 
I need to come up with a set of behaviors to act according to that are not socially prescribed. Um, that's the kind of view of autonomy that lies in the background of this definition. And so now I think, since I don't think anyone in the room is 16, um, it may become a little bit sort of clearer what I think is wrong with this definition of adaptive preferences. So the first thing is um, that it suggests that all preferences that are a result of socialization, and maybe all preferences, depending on your worldview, are adaptive. So I have the maybe all preferences view there because some people hold a view that we have no preferences that are not a reaction to or a result of our socialization. So you might say that like, if I reject gender normativity, it's actually just because of another set of gender roles that are available to me in my society. So like, I leave, what to, I leave wearing makeup and high heels to like, I'm from the 90s, so like to become a riot girl. You might tell, um, the story you might tell about how that happens is just that I left one set of social roles to accept another set of social roles. It's not clear that one is less an effect of socialization than the other. Um, so if you think all preferences are potentially results of socialization, then all preferences become morally pro problematic in the way that I'm saying adaptive preferences are. Um, even if you don't buy that, that all preferences are a result of socialization, most of us think that there are plenty of good preferences that are respect worthy that come from socialization. So um, most people would argue that most morally good behaviors are behaviors we're socialized into. So my sister always jokes, I'm the oldest kid, and she always jokes about how I used to um, quit games when it was no longer my turn. <laughs> um, I got punished for that a lot. Um, so the, my preference now to not quit games when it's no longer my turn seems to me to be a result of socialization and norms about good sportsmanship and conduct with other people that my society taught to me. Um, on this definition of adaptive preferences, um, that my preference to now wait and like let my sister play her turn and the preference to undernourish myself because my society says women and men um, both deserve, um, both deserve, uh, or women and men deserve, women deserve less food than men, are the same kind of preference. Another problem along these lines for folks who want to think about it is that it doesn't distinguish between the preferences of oppressors and the oppressed. So, um, oppressors may not question their role as oppressors, and oppressed people may not question their role as oppressed. If the problem is just not questioning your social role, it's happening equally to the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, and it seems to me at least like um, there is something especially problematic about adaptive preferences wherein you are harming yourself. There, are, there is also of course something problematic in preferences in which you're harming other people. But I don't think that the socialization distinction really captures that. Um, a second sort of um, problem I have um, with the view that adaptive preferences are deficits in the ability to resist socialization um, is that they suggest that something is really inherently wrong with any kind of life that deeply values conventionalism. So by that I mean like a life where you say I'm going to have unquestioning religious devotion or um, I just care a lot about um, whether other people like me, or I'm going to do X, Y, or Z because this is my culture. Um, there's some folks in the room who saw my talk at the Grad Center a couple of weeks ago, and that talk was about why we should respect people who have um, unquestioning conventionalism. But whether or not um, you want to go into um, that other talk, the people who say they want to respect autonomy say that what they're interested in partly is respecting a variety of ideas of what it's like to have a good life. So if I define autonomy as this, like you must reject socialization to have a good life, it seems like I'm kicking away a lot of what the person who wants to call adaptive preferences autonomy deficits wants. They want to respect a variety of different understandings of a good life. Now they have kicked away out of being respect worthy a really significant chunk of humanity. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm going to go into a third definition of adaptive preferences as autonomy deficits. Um, and this is, um, this is the most popular one. It's the one I spend m the most time arguing with people about. Mm. And it's the view that um, autonomy requires self-esteem. So the view doesn't say autonomy is the same thing as self-esteem, of course. Like, if you're a philosopher, that's not going to work for you. But it says that self-esteem is a requirement for autonomy. Um, and then if you're going to define adaptive preferences in this self-esteem-based way, uh, what you might say is something like, in order to have your own plan of life or your own values, you have to fundamentally value yourself. Treating yourself as an instrument to the well-being of others is incompatible with being your own person. And then you might say, well, what's wrong with these preferences is that the agent in question doesn't sufficiently value her own welfare, right? So why does she eat less than her husband? Because she um, doesn't yet see that she's a full person. Um, this and that view that um, women in the global south perpetuate their oppression because they don't believe that they are people or they don't believe that they have rights, um, that view is really widespread. I think there's sort of pernicious and less pernicious versions of it. But as you're going to see kind of in the Q&A and more, the more I go on in this talk, I think that view is a, like is a little bit racist. Um, I think that view denies the extent to which deprived people reason about their situations. And I think people would be unlikely to accept that view when we, if they were trying to explain why women in the global north um, accept their oppression. Right? They would be very unlikely to say, oh, like, why am I standing here in high heels? It must be because I don't know that I am a person with worth. Um, okay, so that's the view. I want to talk about a couple of problems with that view. So the first one is, um, and this is something I keep saying, and I think I'm one of the only people saying, is that people can gain self-worth from complying with oppressive norms. Um, I think one of the things that oppression does a lot of the time is morally reward oppressed people for perpetuating their oppression. Um, and, um, and because perpetuating your oppression is sometimes difficult, right? like you have to say no to the food, people also often have to work to become better or better at perpetuating their oppression. So if you go read, like for the philosophers in the room, um, theories of well-being, one of the most common things they'll say is the way you get welfare, the way you get satisfaction is by performing an excellence. Right, like you find something that's a skill and you go sort of adopt that skill. What I want to say is that um, oppressive societies develop oppression perpetuation as a skill for oppressed people very frequently. And I think the Javanese example is a great example of that. You can see in that example because you have the old woman talking to the daughter, right? The daughter is asking a question like, I want to eat, why can't I eat as much as my brother or whatever? And the old lady is saying, oh, because, look, this is what is morally required of you as a woman. What is morally required of you as a woman is to control these out of control appetites you have. And then by the time you are older, right, one of the things that people are constantly praising you for is your ability to be a good woman who denies herself food, who doesn't speak up too much, etc. So. I think it's totally possible, and I think, um, you know, I would not just say that I think that I know of examples of this, I think I sometimes am an example of this, that people derive their self-worth partly from complying with oppressive norms. So I think it's completely possible to comply with an oppressive norm um, and get self-worth from doing it. Now, one of the things that, um, the objections I get immediately whenever I say this, is, but, oh, you know, self-worth isn't just subjective, right? Like, you might feel happy about denying yourself food, but at the end of the day, you're denying yourself food, so your well-being is actually decreasing, whether or not you feel like your well-being is decreasing. And so that brings me to my second problem with this view. Um, and that is that 
oppressive structures often create situations um, where oppressive, where complying with an oppressive norm is the best thing an oppressed person can do to advance their welfare. So to sort of explain why that's the case, because I have it written here as oppressive norm compliance even without internalization, may be a welfare maximizing strategy under unjust conditions. Um, I just want to talk about oppressive norm compliance versus oppressive norm internalization. So complying with an oppressive norm just means doing what that norm dictates you should do. So if I live in a society that says women should eat less than men, um, if I comply, when I feed my husband the nutritionally superior food, I am complying with the norm. You can comply with an oppressive norm without internalizing it. And I think that's something that is overlooked a lot in the literature that people, um, that people cite about this. Because internalizing an oppressive norm means that you believe the norm is true. So I, it's possible for me to feed myself less food than my husband in a society that says that that's what I should do but to not believe that that state of affairs is correct. Um, now, to turn that into a critique of the adaptive preferences or self-esteem deficits view, what I want to suggest is that um, oppressed people are often in situations where it doesn't matter whether they've internalized the oppressive norm or not. Complying with the oppressive norm is the best route to their welfare. So. The example I always use um, from the United States when I'm teaching this to students is there's plenty of data showing that um, a woman is more likely to get a job if she shows up at the job interview wearing makeup. Um, I don't wear makeup in my life. I always wear makeup to job interviews. Um, one story you can tell, and I, I, you, it's clear to you guys that I think that that norm is wrong and shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, I do it anyway. Well, why do I do it? Because I do everything I can to make sure that I get this job. And my showing up not wearing makeup isn't going to change the norm, right? Like the norm, like one, my one act of non-compliance isn't going to change the norm. It's a collective action problem. Um, similarly, to kind of talk about it in terms of the examples that I used here, um, I think one thing that oppressive societies do is something that I call harm-benefit bundling, which means that if you are a member of an oppressed group, in order to access a certain benefit, you have to accept a certain harm. So um, to get to talk about sort of the good wife and the good beating, um, if you live in a society with a high level of patriarchal risk, which means a society in which um, women's access to various things that are constitutive of welfare, like income, food, social status, etc., are dependent on a relationship with a man, it is in your interests objectively to retain a good relationship with the man who is your patron, right? Like, if you are never, if you live in a society where people will, so to go to an example about South Asia, where no one will hire or rent a home to a divorced woman. Um, you are dependent on your husband for income. You're dependent on your husband for safety. You're dependent on your husband for a variety of other things. Um, saying that you submitting to a good beating or saying that you believe that a good wife um, is the kind of wife who doesn't stand up to her husband is in your interest, right? Like you need to curry favor with your male relatives. So part of why you are, might comply with this norm may have nothing to do with your internalization of it. And so actually, under some circumstances, the best thing you can do to maximize your welfare is to comply with the oppressive norm. So it's not just the case, as I say in one, um, that you can feel good because you comply with oppressive norms. I think it's also the case that oppression often also makes it so that the best option for you will always be an option that has a self-undermining element. Um, okay. So that is, so I'm almost done. <laughs> I, um, so I've told you my goal has been kind of to show 
why I think we shouldn't define adaptive preferences as deficits and autonomy, um, or why at least why I think that we, that doesn't explain what's morally problematic about them. Um, in a nutshell, if you were to ask me sort of what I don't like about those two views, I would tell you these two things. Um, the first one is that I think the view that adaptive preferences are autonomy deficits has a tendency to do something I call psychologizing the structural. Um, what I mean by that is assuming that the reason that a person is complying with oppressive norms is because of some defect in their reasoning or their thinking, when in fact I think the defect is often in the way that the world is structured. So the world is often structured in a way where even if you don't internalize the oppressive norm, um, you have reasons to comply with it. But then people come, people who are obsessed with adaptive preferences as autonomy deficits come look at you and say, why do you comply? And instead of looking at the world structures first, they say, oh, how did you come to believe that the state of affairs was acceptable? Um, and I just want you to know, because I've been read like this a lot, I don't think that no adaptive preferences are autonomy deficits. I just don't think that that is the central, uh, the central issue with adaptive preferences, or that's what makes them especially morally problematic. The second thing I don't like about sort of autonomy-based approaches to adaptive preferences um, is the suggestion, and you saw this in my rejection of the rationality argument, that complying with oppressive norms shows that you are somehow um, cognitively debilitated. So um, at, I, as you can kind of see, I really look at this from a point of view where I assume that people have reasons for complying with oppressive norms. Um, and I'm very worried about views that say, oh, if you comply with oppressive norms, it shows that something was faulty about your reasoning or faulty about the way you acquired your beliefs. Um, so that's the view I don't like. I'm going to spend sort of the last minute um, telling you what I think adaptive preferences are. And of course, you can ask me more about it in the question and answer session if you want. But I can't do everything. So, <laughs> so I, I actually think that what adaptive preferences are and why they bother people um, is that they are deficits in the ability to achieve basic well-being. So, I don't think that what's wrong with them primarily is that anything was sort of altered in the, in the consciousness of the person who has adaptive preferences. I think that can happen. But I think that what makes them distinctive is that they are uh, deficits in the ability to achieve basic well-being that are socially created. Um, and as I say here, I think sometimes they involve deficient autonomy. Um, sometimes they involve mistaken beliefs about self-worth, but sometimes they involve neither. So I think that what makes them a moral and political problem at the end of the day is something to do with how they compromise the well-being of the person who holds them. Um, now, people who like autonomy-based definitions immediately want to come back to me and say, okay, so then you're fine with imposing a conception of the good on people, right? Because I'm now saying these preferences are, have a problem because they are, um, they are deficits in the ability to achieve a good life. A person who likes autonomy-based definitions is going to come to me and say, well, so you're, you have to take a stance about what a good life is in order for your definition to work. So what I want to say about that is, yes, I do have to take a stance about what a good life is, um, and I'm happy to do that. But I don't think that that has to involve um, some of the things that autonomy theorists are really worried about. So I don't think it has to involve um, imposing a culturally specific conception of the good on people. Um, and I don't think it has to involve imposing anything at all. So I say that if we formulate the conception of the good in the right way, we can get a lot of the things that autonomy theorists are worried about without the bad consequences of autonomy theories. So specifically, I say we should use a conception of the good. Um, I say it should have three features, that it should be um, um, justificatorily minimal, substantively minimal, and vague. Um, so by that I mean, um, it should, the conception of the good should be the product of cross-cultural deliberation. Um, it's justificatorily minimal means that it is justifiable from a variety of different worldviews, like may they be cultural, religious, personal, etc. 
Um, substantively minimal means focused only on sort of the basic elements of well-being because I think we have sort of greater consensus about what makes a life go very badly than we do about what makes a life go well or excellently. Um, and then I say vague because um, part of, so I think that the conception of the good should include things that are formulated like adequate nutrition instead of things like the right to drink crystal geyser natural spring water. Um, and part, part of the reason for that is that I want to make clear that there isn't one model of how you get from compromised well-being to having opportunities for well-being. Um, so the vagueness allows you to think about multiple ways to implement it. And the vagueness also kind of gives a very clear reason for deliberating with people who do perpetuate their oppression and deprivation about what should happen to them. Because they have knowledge that is contextually specific that the intervener probably does not have. An autonomy-based definition, by contrast, is likely to say, is likely to like kick out the whole reason for respecting their knowledge, supposedly um, in the interests of um, respecting a variety of different conceptions of the good. So I want to say, if we just formulate the conception of the good in a way that is cross-culturally deliberated on and minimal, and insist on deliberating with um, deprived people about why they have the preferences they do and what should be done about them. We can get a lot of the autonomy, what the autonomy theorists are trying to get without having the unfortunate consequence of um, sort of coming up with what I see as often insulting or inaccurate reasons for explaining why people perpetuate. Ooh, my phone is going off. My timing is so good. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think it's better to think of adaptive preferences as deficits in the ability to lead a flourishing life as long as you formulate the conception of the good in this way. And I will stop there and um, take any questions that you, or comments that you guys have.